Good morning. A reading from the eight master lessons of nature. What nature teaches us about living well in the world by Gary Ferguson. In a fascinating but largely unsung slice of Western history, during the 1600s through roughly the mid 1700s, there arose in nearly all the major Protestant churches of England a powerful movement celebrating the generous relational quality of humans. Appealing to, quote, the man of feeling, close quote, this perspective served as a much needed counterbalance in a time when many considered humans to be hopelessly wicked. The famous 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes, for example, saw people as by nature debased, capable of decency and kindness only when muscled into good behavior by frighteningly stern, powerful leaders. The Man of Feeling movement pushed back as well against the brittle notions of Puritans, who back then routinely insisted humans were cursed by depravity. Identified by the somewhat chewy name of Latitudinarians, this enormous and enormously light-hearted group spread a message of exquisite comfort, extolling a natural impulse in humans to gain freedom through caring, tenderness, and charity. While the leadership of a great many churches resisted the Latitudinarians, fearing that they were giving a green light to human passions, their messages of kindness and tolerance flooded the sanctuaries and lyceums of England for more than 70 years. The fracturing of religious practice and belief created a grave problem for the Reformed Anglican Church, that is, declining dedication to the state religion. For us, the notion of a state religion is problematic, but we live in a nation born during the Enlightenment, which nation explicitly outlawed the establishment of state religions in its infancy. This was a very deliberate choice, given that each of the 13 American colonies had at some point in the 18th century a state-supported religion. Even today, national religions are common, particularly in Islam. The Latitudinarians, or Latitude Men, were initially academics and clergy from Cambridge University in England. Their ambition was to persuade the religiously fractured population to return to the Anglican Communion, the state church. They advocated a couple of basic principles to achieve this. Among these were the importance of religion in the well-being of a nation and the insignificant of almost all the doctrinal disputes among the various sects. It is this latter point which gives rise to the latitude label. It had become obvious that it is impossible to dictate belief upon command, and only sincere belief is productive of virtue and salvation. They promoted wide tolerance of, and even indifference to, varying religious dogma and practice for the sake of togetherness in the state church. A pertinent, ex a pertinent example for us is the routine worship of Unitarians in Anglican churches in the late 17th century. Obviously, the rejection of the Trinity wasn't much of an obstacle. This movement eventually created what became known as the Broad Church and continues today in many denominations. But why was togetherness in the state church considered important? Why is it considered important in much of the world today? 
It was an in based on the notion that the state should promote virtue among the citizenry, and secular government is poor at achieving this. Our contentious politics today tends to confirm, in my mind, that politics and government are not the places to look to find virtue. This ancient wisdom was well understood, so religious institutions were enlisted to do the job of creating virtuous citizens. Of course, when the government sanctions and supports with tax dollars a particular church, and thereby makes membership therein a requisite of citizenship and patriotism, that church tends to become an arm of the government, with all of the faults of government as a source of virtue. How were the latitudinarians able to persuade many contentious religionists that most of their disputes were insignificant? Simply put, the entire society was swimming in the rising tide of the soon-to-come age of reason. For example, the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, the oldest national scientific society in the world, originated in 1660 and was given a royal charter of incorporation by Charles II in 1662. Importantly, although it had royal patronage almost from the start, the Society has always remained a voluntary organization, independent of the British state. Certainly the Latitudinarians knew promoting, a, promoting pure reason and rationality to believers in a religion based on God's revelations was a non-starter. But a blending of reason and revelation had strong appeal. Reason dictates openness to observation and persuasion. Revelation dictates knowledge of the past and acceptance of the conclusions arising therefrom. One promotes human joy and adventure, and the other promotes human contentment in certainty. Given the appeal of both reason and revelation, minimizing any conflict between them first requires distilling them down to their essence and being humble about the utility of each. We can tend to view the Latitudinarians as dismissive of dogma, but they certainly held strongly to much we regard as core dogma in Christianity today. They made free thinking in religion more respectable, but not to the point of refuting core dogma. Their latitude had its limits, as any useful worldview must. Nevertheless, their society was inclined to embrace toleration and inclusivity, given the recent history of the times. In the sense that there is nothing new under the sun, most individuals today are all over the board throughout their lives, balancing the influence of reason and revelation among other influences, such as familial love, basic animal needs, and emotions. Of course, conundrums arise. A heavy reliance on reason leaves many discontent because the limitations of the human animal's mind are manifest. A heavy reliance on revelation suffers from the stark truth that any source of revelation is necessarily speculative and is fil filtered through fellow humans. Many claiming to have applied reason to reach sincerely held views are opposed by many others. Many claiming to know revealed truths reach sincerely held views, which are opposed by many others. Compounding this with the human failings of insincerity and manipulation enhances the challenge. Yet we want to know, we want to live virtuously, we want to be remembered fondly. 
We Unitarian Universalists often maintain we incorporate both reason and revelation in our religious outlook. But do we simply reason to self-adoration and cherry-pick comfortable revelations? If we do, is this okay if we thereby find contentment in a world often pushing us to discontent? I suggest we promote mindfulness regarding what we are doing in our religious quests. Use both reason and revelation, or if you prefer, the wisdom of the ages. Use the power of your own mind through reason, and use the power of other minds through revelation. Be cognizant of what you are doing and vo avoid the temptations of exalting yourself or abandoning yourself. Reason and skepticism have brought us a materially glorious life. Revelation and submission have brought us control of our passions. Together they can bring hope to the individual and hope to the world. One of the great unintended consequences of the latitudinarian dominance in the Church of England was the later rise of what was called the Man of Feeling movement. It began in 1771 with a series of novels by Scottish writer Henry Mackenzie. The book was called The Man of Feeling and it spawned hundreds of other best-selling sentimental novels. The whole genre was critically panned at the time, and literary historian R.S. Crane described it as pleasing anguish that sweetly melts the mind and terminates in a self-approving joy. The romantic novels were written with the goal of telling the stories of fictional people, representing those who would otherwise not be heard, to promote benevolence and compassion. It was a radical idea in those days that human virtue could give birth to a universal benevolence, not created by God, but by ourselves. They asserted that benevolence was not only natural, but that it felt good and that it was okay to feel good about having compassion toward others. This was radical stuff in the 18th century, and it never would have existed without the moral and religious teachings of the latitudinarians. The idea of benevolence, that human beings would take pleasure in caring for one another, in part that led to the democracy that came into being in this country. On Wednesday, I heard a conversation on NPR about what is wrong and could still be right with democracy in the United States today. Two women from opposite ends of the political spectrum, though admittedly both more centrist than extremist, were engaged with each other for the purpose of finding their common ground. They were invited to deeply listen to each other. Sure, they disagreed on specific issues like abortion, the unlimited right to bear arms, and what constitutes fake news. The self-described conservative said she knows where moral authority comes from, God. And the liberal was not so sure about who gets to decide what is true or right. But the thing they absolutely agreed upon was that individualism, what they both thought of as the goal of the American project is actually leading to the extremism that is tearing us apart as a nation. They agreed that simply listening compassionately to each other's stories and understanding where their beliefs come from was valuable in countering extremism. An extremism they both believe has the power to drive us into civil war. They were talking, of course, about the classic struggle, the thing I seem to always be preaching about, between the rights of the individual and the good of the whole. Who decides what is reasonable? And who decides what is right? 
What is the moral truth handed down by God and how much respect do we give to, give to others simply because it's the right thing to do? Is feeling good about ourselves and each other enough to prevent us from heading towards civil war? Let's look again for a moment at the English Civil War. At its core, it was about two things. The power and authority of the church and government and the beliefs and needs of the people versus those of the old guard, the elites who have always ruled the land. Of course, the comparison to the United States right now isn't perfect. But what it boiled down to was a war between two factions of people who each thought what I think is good, moral, and right is the ultimate truth. And I am willing to go against my countrymen, my neighbors, and even my own family over that truth. Does that sound familiar? The other similarity between England then and the United States now is that its conflict was in large part the result of a massive pendulum swing in the religious consciousness of the people. After hundreds of years of domination, the excesses of the Catholic Church caused revolution. It took a while, but the Puritans stripped back everything about the Catholic Church from the vestments of the clergy and the ornateness of the sanctuaries to the message of the hymns. The Puritans gained influence with a clear and simple message that resonated with the masses and encouraged a huge amount of public judgment about the behaviors of ordinary people. So after the Roundheads took control of the government following a bloody war, and stripped the church of its power. It's not surprising that when they later lost control to the newly crowned King Charles I, he ushered in a period in which the Church of England was restored, and with it, a new tolerance for differences in doctrinal opinion. Of course, all of this shifting wasn't happening in a bubble in the British Isles. Puritans, and others, including early Unitarians and Universalists, migrated to the land that was becoming the United States. And that attitude of religious tolerance has been the norm here, until fairly recently. Now, while we might see our population as churched and unchurched, I think it might be more precise to say that the two categories we fit into are seekers of definitive answers about right and wrong and seekers of understanding. One wants churches and political leaders to be aligned, guided by the word of God. The other tends to be more politically liberal and most likely unchurched. You could call that second type the new latitudinarians. The thing to know about the original latitudinarians of the 17th century, though, is that they gave a lot of lip service to accepting a diversity of doctrinal beliefs for the sake of church unity. But they never really took it seriously. They were, after all, men of the church, men of the institution that had a very clear theology about the meaning of the life of Jesus and his impact on humanity. To, pray, to paraphrase their thinking in today's parlance, you can believe whatever crazy nonsense you want to believe. There's room for you. You still belong to the church. In that church, those who wanted definitive answers to life's big questions could find them. And those who wanted to find the sacred in their own benevolence and the narratives of the, of the less fortunate could also find them. On the surface, it looks like there was a lot of compassionate understanding happening. But then the dominant narrative wasn't, I want to understand you. The dominant narrative was, I need you to understand me. There was a lot more talking going on than listening. Does that sound familiar? Here we are at another impasse. 
it feels like we're headed towards civil war. And once again, it's all about the power conservative churches have in the legislatures and courts and who will govern and how. It seems to me that if we want to pull the pendulum back from the extreme, we have to not be like the pet latitudinarians. We must nurture philosophical diversity and actually value it. Like the men of feeling, we have to seek understanding and build compassion. We have to actually listen to and care about the stories of the people we don't agree with. Look, the vast majority of us don't want a civil war. We don't want to battle at arms with our neighbors and our family. So the ultimate question right now has to be, what will get us where we want to be? What can we do, each of us, to avoid moving closer to a civil war? We have to find balance. We have to pull the pendulum closer to the center. Personally, I think the only way we're going to do that is to do what those two women on NPR did earlier this week. Talk to someone who is an opponent, not an enemy. Honestly, whenever I hear anyone talk about someone from the other side of the political or religious spectrum in this country as an enemy, it makes me sick to my stomach. Is that how you talk about your fellow country folk? It's got to change. And that change starts with you, with each of us. It's time to start once again living up to the promises this country was built on. That we could take pleasure in caring for each other and our democracy without relying on religious authority or political authoritarians to make our decisions for us and pit us against one another. May we have the conviction to really listen to one another and the strength to be truly benevolent. You know what made it easy for the Church of England to survive financially, even as it lost a vast majority of its members to other newer denominations? It was the official Church of the Nation. It was funded by the National Treasury. In the United States, we had state churches for a little while, but that all ended in the 19th century. How can you have a true democracy after all? when the church and the government are one. Now, we are on our own. Each denomination is responsible for raising its own funds among its own people. And in an association of congregations like ours, without a central body overseeing each congregation and providing some kind of financing, we are truly on our own. We rely on each other to make sure this continues, serving our own needs, and more importantly, the needs of our community. So please give as generously as you can by sending a check, either to fulfill your pledge or to make a first-time donation. Thank you for being here and for caring enough to keep the message alive.
I'd like to close this time of worship with the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. A person will worship something, have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. We join hands in Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, pledging ourselves to an individual religious freedom which transcends all creeds, not to think alike, but to journey together.